I am Jessica Barajas, Research and Policy Associate at the Learning Policy Institute. And together with the Learning Policy Institute, today's learning session is being hosted by the California Partnership for the Future of Learning, which is a statewide alliance of community organizing and advocacy groups advancing a shared vision of a transformational, racially just education system. The partnership is led by Advancement Project California, Californians for Justice, Pico California and public advocates with the support of Community Coalition, Inner City Struggle, and, a, and over a dozen of other grassroots organizations, as well as research and philanthropic partners. So we just wanna share also that the learning session has been developed collaboratively through a California partnership working group, as well as partners who share their expertise with us as we were planning this session. And these members, um, come from the Inland Congregations United for Change, Advancement Project California, Community Coalition, the California Partnership for the Future of Learning, UCLA, the National Education Association, and the National Center for Community Schools. And then as you see on the screen, we wanna show you who we have with us this, this evening. We had over 186 participants registered representing students, families, organizers, community partners, advocates, researchers, and the district and school staff from the organizations and districts that you see here on the screen. So we just wanna take a moment to really appreciate everyone for being here. We know that it's a difficult time with COVID, with some of the isolation that has been happening. And the speakers that you see here are still keeping schools and organizations running. So thank you for making time for us. And thank you to all of you who are also taking care of your families, who are engaged in your own organizing efforts and are still here this evening to be part of the change. So to get us started, um, I wanna introduce you to Rosa Isela Roman Pescador a parent leader with Orange County Congregation Community Organization, part of Pico California Education for Liberation. And Rosa Isela will share with us her vision for school transformation through community schools and the importance of parents and caregivers as partners in the change process. Rosa Isela. Hi, hello. Um, hello, my name is Rosa Isela. Um, I'm very happy and excited to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, a, little, a little bit about myself. I am a parent volunteer in the city of Anaheim, um, the Anaheim Elementary School District and the Anaheim Un Union High School District. I'm also a, an active uh, parent leader with OCO. I have um, three children. Uh, my eldest is Nathan, who is, who is 13 years old and is a seventh grader at Sycamore Junior High. Um, within the Anaheim Union High School District. Um, Jaylene is eight years old and attends Thomas Edison Elementary um, in the Anaheim Elementary School District. I also have an 11 month old baby who is most likely can attend these schools in the future. Um, I want to thank Policy Institute and the California Partnership for the Future of Learning um, for hosting this first in their series of learning sessions and for wanting to hear directly from parents and families. Um, it truly highlights um, their commitment for an equitable process in the implementation of the $3 billion community schools grant. Um, personally, I believe community um, schools are important because they can provide a multitude of benefits to their students, staff, parents, and neighborhoods, as well as transforming our school's climate to be more healing and more student oriented. I also believe that community um, schools will help promote community and parent um, involvement and programming. Um, one of the things I do appreciate about Sycamore Junior High is that it has started to make a plan to be a community school, which is uh, one of the two community schools in my district and the entire county. This decision happened before um, anyone knew of the $3 billion that would be available. Um, it showed that there was a commitment to support our particular school community as at a much deeper level. Um, however, I do feel like there is um, still room for more improvement in terms of family and student um, engagement to educate um, everyone on community schools and bring us into the structure. Um, shared decision-making needs to uh, be at the forefront of how we transform into 
racially just relationship centered and transformative community schools. Um, the engagement from parents, students, and community partners has been uh, minimal, but it has been through the relationship that OCO um, has that we as parents have been able to have representation in uh, decision, make, decision making. Um, encouraging parent engagement is more than common courtesy. It's one of the best ways to create a positive learning environment for every student. Um, it is also very important for parents to be involved in their children's education, both at um, individual level and at the school system level through um, shared ownership and leadership. Because as parents know our students' um, best interests, we want the best for them. So no matter our income, our background, students with parents who are more involved in education are more likely to have higher grades, best test scores, and better relationships with their school. Children whose parents are more involved will attend school regularly, have um, better social skills and show improved behavior um, and adapt well to school. Allowing the wisdom of our parents to enter can have a greater impact on our own students and other students' education. Um, parents, teachers, administrators, and policymakers all share a responsibility um, to provide a quality education for all of our students. And it's up to everyone to make sure we're all delivering on our responsibilities collectively, um, which brings me back to my hopes and dreams for my own children. Um, I, I do hope one day my kids look back and know that their parents were there um, with them every step of the way in their education and that thanks to all of the workshops the forums, community support, we were able to provide the best education for them. Um, I choose to be part of my children's education and I refuse to just be a checkbox. I want to thank uh, the Learning Policy Institute and the California Partnership for the Future of Learning for hosting this and creating a space for parents and students to learn and share together. Thank you. And now back to you, Jessica. Thank you, Rosicela, for your words. Next, I want to introduce you to Anna Meyer, Research Analyst and Policy Advisor at the Learning Policy Institute. And Anna will share with us a brief research presentation on the key elements of community schools and their benefits. Anna. Thanks, Jessica. I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Um, next slide, please. I'd like just to start out by grounding this conversation in an exciting moment that we find ourselves in, which is the $3 billion investment to support the development of community schools throughout California, including funds for technical assistance. And as you can see here, this builds on an initial $45 million investment to establish a California Community Schools Partnership Grant Program. Next slide, please. I also think it's helpful to ground the conversation in a definition of what community schools are, which you can see here, both a place and also a set of relationships between members of a school community, students, families, educators, and community partners, and the resources they bring. Next slide. Community schools are a research-backed strategy, which is what I'm going to focus on today. In 2017, the Learning Policy Institute and the National Education Policy Center released a community schools research review that looked at over 140 studies. And that's what you see here pictured. Next slide. Overall, this review found a wide range of benefits associated with community schools. This includes shorter term benefits such as increased attendance rates and improvements in students' attitudes towards school, as well as longer term benefits such as improved test scores, grades, especially in mathematics, and increased high school graduation rates. We also found some evidence that community schools can help to close achievement gaps for low income students, English learners, and students in special education as well as a cost benefit savings of up to $15 for every dollar invested. This review also found four common features or pillars of community schools, and these pillars form the basis of the California State Grant Program. 
It's important to know that to note that while the pillars are evidence based, they don't fully capture the on the ground wisdom of practitioners and community members who have been doing this work for many years. There is a newly approved California state framework, which was informed by community listening sessions that the California partnership helped to organize and some of you may have joined those sessions. And I think that framework starts to address some of those gaps. And I'll also try to fill in some gaps as I discuss each of the pillars. Next slide. The first pillar is integrated student supports, which is also sometimes known as wraparound services. This includes things like dental care, counseling, physical health care, housing access, and transportation and food assistance, often facilitated by a full-time community school coordinator. Of course, the foundation to effectively supporting students is to have a welcoming and inclusive environment with positive relationships. We know this from research on how young people develop. In addition, it's important to think of supporting family members, teachers, and staff, as well as student needs, especially during COVID. And finally, mapping assets and needs with a lot of input from students, families, and community members is really important for planning and implementing integrated student supports. And of course, that's what we're learning about today during this session. And mapping assets and needs is also called out as a key practice in the newly approved state framework. Next slide. The second pillar is expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities. This includes academic support, enrichment, and real-world learning, things like work-based learning, internships, and project-based learning that take place during the school day, after school, over the weekend, and during the summer. Rich and engaging learning experiences are hands-on, they're culturally sustaining, and they connect to students' interests and lived experiences. Community partners can play an important role by offering after-school programming, teaching extracurricular courses, providing push-in support in classrooms, and serving as partners for hands-on projects. And I know that the educators we're going to hear from today can share really compelling examples of what these learning experiences look like in their community schools. Next slide. The third pillar is active family and community engagement. This means inviting parents, caregivers, and other family members to the school, not just to volunteer or partake in services, but also to serve as true partners in supporting and educating students. And we heard Rosa Sellis speak to this just a moment ago. This is so important and there's a lot of room for growth uh, when it comes to this. A dual capacity building approach is here, supporting both educators and families to engage with each other, for example, through home visits, it's also important to think about student voice as well, for example, through student-led conferences, just examples. So it's, there's other way, ways to think about these as well. And something I've really learned from the California Partnership is the importance of providing opportunities for engagement in languages spoken at home, like we're doing here today. Next slide. The last and arguably most transformational pillar is collaborative leadership and practices. This means establishing a culture of professional learning, collective trust, and shared responsibility for outcomes through strategies, such as having a site-based leadership team, employing a community school coordinator or manager or director, they're sometimes called, and supporting teacher learning communities. Collaborative leadership requires shared governance structures for meaningful decision-making that includes students, families, and staff. It's also helpful for all members of the school community to be on the same page about the challenges, the proposed solutions, and how progress will be measured. In other words, taking a shared approach to continuous improvement. I know we'll hear about that today as well. And during COVID, community schools were better situated than most schools to respond quickly and effectively to challenges, in no small part due to their collaborative leadership structures, their trusting relationships with students and families, and their existing partnerships with community-based organizations. So with that, I'm going to stop. We have a lot of amazing speakers to hear from today, so I will hand things back to Jessica. Thanks, Anna, for grounding us more about what community schools are and their benefits. And also joining us today, we have Abe Fernandez, the director of the National Center for Community Schools, 
And I'm going to pass it over to him to share with us more concretely about the importance and benefits of school communities conducting an inclusive and thorough needs and assets assessment, which is the topic of discussion for today. Abe. Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, many thanks for the opportunity uh, to share a little bit from our experience and our practice on the importance of needs and assets assessments. And many thanks to everyone for joining this evening. Um, I have the privilege of leading the National Center for Community Schools, which works with communities all over the, the country to start up, uh, to sustain, and to um, support uh, community schools at all stages of development. I'm actually coming to you from New York City, where it's a little bit later and much, much colder. Um, but being here with you has given me lots of warmth and positive energy. So I appreciate um, this opportunity. You know, one of the first lessons that we at the National Center teach folks about community schools is that community schools are a strategy, not a program. And what we mean is that there's not necessarily a checklist of programs and services that you have to have, right? Instead, it's a strategy that takes into account the values, the experiences, um, the voices, all kinds of data, and much, much more of its many stakeholders and jointly makes decisions about how we will leverage the assets and opportunities uh, that we have and then address the needs that we know exist in our community. No two community schools are exactly identical because no two communities are exactly identical. And this is why a needs and assets assessment is so critical. So on this first slide here, um, you'll see that we're, we're defining it as a process. Um, it's, it's one really important tool in understanding the landscape in setting priorities and in making decisions. And the truth is that sometimes we need a more comprehensive and inclusive approach to making really good decisions. And I'll share an example on this next slide. So here is what you might consider to be a typical meeting of a school leadership team. And here they are, they're meeting as they often do, and they're trying to decide what to work on um, as a school community. And so now let's listen into their conversation. If we go to the person on the left here, you'll see that this person is worried about the sugary drinks in the cafeteria, which, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. That's a real concern. We should talk about that. Um, and that character education, the next person here is saying that character education must be added to the curriculum. Hard to argue with that. Really, really good point. Um, the next person is talking about standards-based testing being better than normed reference testing. I'm not even sure exactly what that means. I'm sure Anna knows what that means. I'm, I'm not really sure, but it sounds pretty important and maybe we should listen to that person. Um, we have someone else here who's concerned that parents aren't adequately involved. And I think every school I've worked with is always trying to work on en engaging and involving more parents. So really good point. And the last person here is saying that, well, by law, all children must be above average which as a former math teacher, that's mathematically impossible, but you know what, let's talk about it. Let's really sort of figure out what's going on here. And so if you want, you can put this in the chat. What else is going on in this, in this cartoon? What else is happening in this story? Um, what else do you see going on? If you look closely at the bottom of this image, you'll see that we have, yes, the kids, thank you, Brenda. You'll see that at the very bottom here, we have a young person who is, um, screaming for his life um, because the school is both on fire and sinking at the same time. Um, now, it's a cartoon. It's kind of funny, right? And then it's not. And then it's not funny. Um, because the fact is that we have many schools. There are many, many schools that have these kinds of burning, sinking issues that are being ignored. And they've been ignored for a very long time. Right? Too often, we're not doing a good enough job creating the space to really understand what's going on, to invite additional voices into the process, to look at a, a wide set of qualitative and quantitative data to inform how we will move forward as a school community. Um, and so in absence of that, without having that young person's voice heard, without having other people who know what's happening in our school community be a part of this process, 
what we end up working on are the personal agendas of those who already have a seat at the table. Now, it may be, it may be that we really do need to work on sugary drinks, right? Um, or parent involvement. But let's be certain that we know that that is the priority that we need to work on. Let's think about what opportunities we have before us to act. Um, and let's make sure that we have additional voices that are involved in this process. All of it leading to action. And on this next slide, let's talk a little bit about what action can lead to, can lead to right? So, um, you know, and by the way, these processes go by, by many different names. It could be called the needs and assets assessment. It could be a needs and opportunities assessment, a needs assessment and resource inventory. We don't care what you call it. We just think everyone needs to do this. Um, and so it, this, this, this chart, I think, is also trying to describe that there is really action involved in this work. We're not just doing this so we can write a report. Um, this should lead to action. And if you look at this chart here, at the end of a process, you're gonna learn a couple things. You're gonna learn exactly what all the current needs are in your community. And you're also going to have a sense of what all the opportunities are, the things that you're currently doing, the things that you have accessible to you, available to you. Um, and so the real goal here is to, if you look in the middle of this slide, is you want to see this sweet spot. So if you can advance the animation here, there's a sweet spot that's really, really good news, right? What's happening in the sweet spot in the middle is that there are a number of needs that you have identified that you are currently meeting. That's awesome. High fives all around. This is really good news. You figured out that there are some things you have going on that are actually of service and really helping people. That's fantastic. Now, if we look at the left side of this chart, you also will notice that there are a bunch of needs you have that are unmet. And that may feel like it's a little bit upsetting, but it's actually kind of exciting because now you have a really good sense. You've done a, if you've done a good job in the process, you now know exactly what you need to work on, which partners you need to engage, which funding you need to go after. It really helps you to prioritize what action's going to look like. So it really gives you kind of a, it charges the school uh, to, to, to move forward. Um, but it's what's on the right side of this chart is a little bit more difficult because what the right side of the chart shows, if you look at the, all the way on the right, is that there are actually some things that you as a school community are providing that nobody needs. So, and I, I think if you think about this, you probably have some examples of this, things that we have just done forever because we always do them. Um, or sometimes you have the principal that can't say no even though we're not really sure if that's the right thing for us to be doing. Or there's some pressure coming from a funder and you have to, you feel obligated to do that even though you know it's not really meeting a need. Um, that's not, that is not what, a good, what good community schools do. Instead, again, the goal is to make that sweet spot even bigger. And one way to do that is to think about how we shift the capacity we have on the right over to the left, which can be done many different ways. One of them is through continuous improvement. You may want to strengthen the quality of the programs that you're offering to make them meet needs. You may want to think about whether you're engaging the right populations with those programs. Maybe instead of working with the fourth graders, we should work with the third graders, for example, depending on what the program is, of course. Um, th there are many ways to do this, or you know, maybe we haven't set that program up for success and we need to do a better job of providing them with information and support and relationships. So it also, it helps you think about and helps you organize your thinking about how to move those programs into a place where they're actually much more, uh, much more connected and they're actually meeting a need that you've identified as a school community. So in the interest of time, and we have a lot to get through today, uh, I guess I'll share just one more slide here, which is a way just to try to capture the lessons that we have learned from doing this work now for decades. Uh, and our process has changed over time, but these lessons really have been pretty consistent throughout all of our work with partners around the country. Uh, and I'll just quickly talk about each one. The first one is building a strong team. And one, of, one really important takeaway here is that this cannot be done by one person. There has to be a group of people involved in this work. Secondly, I know a lot of people think that a needs assessment is all about um, 
doing focus groups. Um, and that's all they sort of focus on. And, and yes, that's important, but we think that you actually need to have some focus first. Um, it's not a good starting point. We think first you wanna do a little bit of learning about what's going on and then get to focus groups. And I can talk more about that later. Um, we want to ask folks to avoid analysis paralysis. Sometimes we hear about these processes that go on for weeks and months and months and nothing really happens. That's not helpful. We wanna to get to action as quickly as we can. Um, be sure to give and receive. You'll find yourselves asking many, many people for information. And a huge mistake that we see people do sometimes is that they ask tons of folks for information to inform their needs assessment, but they never go back and tell those people what we learned and engage those folks in what comes next. So both give and receive. And then finally, um, lather, rinse, repeat. This is something that you don't just do one time um, and you put this down and you don't think again about needs and assets for two or three years. What we're finding is that the most effective community schools are regularly doing this process. Um, and it doesn't have to be a huge process every time, but especially right now, given all that we know about the pandemic and how much it is shifting every day, even if we thought we knew what was going on two months ago, I can guarantee you the needs have changed, the opportunities have changed. It's so important that we make this an ongoing conversation. And with that, I will conclude and I'm looking forward to the, the panel later on. Thank you so much, Abe. As we saw in the chat, that was fire. <laughs> so I think everyone's energized. And for those of us that have been with us and those of us that just joined us, welcome. We just wanna make another reminder to please rename yourself to ESP for Spanish, ENG for English, and AR for Arabic. This is gonna be important as we break you out into groups later on in the programming. Thank you. And with that, we're really excited to dive more into this topic with an amazing panel um, of experienced guests that, um, that Roberta is gonna be moderating. So Roberta Ferger, Senior Writer and Director of Storytelling at the Learning Policy Institute. Take it away. Thanks, Jessica, and good evening, everyone. I am really excited about the panel this evening and really very grateful to our panelists for taking time to share their experience and their expertise in what, as Jessica said earlier, is a really challenging time. We appreciate all of you, and we're appreciating all you do to support students, families, and educators. So with that, let me introduce our amazing panel. Um, from Man UCLA Community School, we have Principal Orlando Johnson and math and science teacher and partnerships and programs coordinator, Sunanda Kushan. From Garfield Elementary School and the East Bay Asian Youth Center, um, also known as Ibasi in Oakland, we have Ibasi Executive Director, David Kakashiba and parent and Ibasi community organizer, Evangelina Lara. From Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School in San Francisco, we have Principal Michael Essien and Community Schools Coordinator Leslie Hu. And last but not least, we have Abe Fernandez, Director of the National Center for Community Schools, who we just heard from. So this, this panel is a bit larger um, than usual, but we think it's really important to share different examples of how communities have gone about conducting their needs and assets assessments. As Abe said, no two communities are alike, so no two assessments will be exactly alike. So what we hope is that with this panel, you'll get an overview of how different places have approached this important opportunity. The format will follow is that I'll ask each of the panelists or the, the community, school communities uh, questions as well as Abe a couple questions, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. So make sure to drop your questions in the panel. Um, and just a reminder to panelists, you have three minutes to answer each question. Okay, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And we'll start with um, our guests from Man UCLA Community School. So welcome again, Orlando and Sunanda. Thank you for joining us on the first week back after winter break. I'm sure it's insane for you all. So our perfect time. <clears throat> so you began the process of transitioning to a community school in 2015. Can you share for us what the factors were that prompted the decision to make that transition and what your earliest first steps were, and if you could include whether and how students and families and educators were involved in that process. Um, I guess I'll start, Ms. Kushan. Um, 
So the first thing, um, you have to pay attention to the signs. You know, when I first became the principal here, um, enrollment was uh, took a, a huge dip. Um, we, uh, at the height of our middle school here, is a historic middle school, almost 100 years old. Um, we had about 2,000 students. When I became the principal, we had about 160 students. So we were in danger of being closed. Um, test scores had been uh, consistently low for the last, I would say, uh, five or seven years prior to me becoming the principal. And then um, um, we had a high uh, teacher turnover. So and particularly in the core subjects, um, uh, which means that the students um, holes in these core subjects were expanding. So that's what existed when I first became the principal and kind of motivated us to try to go in this direction. Ms. Kushan, did you want to add at all? Um, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, the early steps um, were, you know, we didn't want to just move. So we wanted to gather information. Um, we wanted to survey stakeholders um, as a district, you know, with Los Angeles Unified School District, we already do a, a yearly a school experience survey. In addition to that, we did an original survey of our parents, of our families, of the teachers, of the students, of, of what they would want in their school. Because we looked at the fact that, I think the culture today is that um, parents have more choice and they were choosing other options. And so what did they want in their school? Um, and once we gathered that information, we started to build, we started to plan. You know, we had to build confidence in the teachers that this wasn't just another turnaround or another takeover or something like that, that this was really truly going to be a collaboration. And we just started to build. Um, we used that data to again, again to build a plan. Um, and then we also did request some autonomies from the UTLA contract so that we can do certain things, particularly for that teacher turnover. You know, a lot of times we have some vacancies, the district would just kind of place somebody there. And we wanted to have people at our school that believed in the vision. So getting those autonomies was really huge. And then um, solidifying an MOU with UCLA um, and LAUSD meant that LAUSD is committed and UCLA is committed. And that I think gave us credibility. So I think that was the beginning of, of the rationale behind it and what we did in the beginning to try to start this journey. Thank you so much for that context. And you mentioned UCLA. UCLA is a core partner with the community school. And important. It is, it is, but I think what's key for a community school is, is definitely UCLA is, the, is, the, is our core partner, the most committed, but it's not the only partnership that we have. Again, it's a community school, so you work with different organizations, different community organizations. What I will say is UCLA helps because one, we want our kids to go to college, so why not partner with one of the best colleges in the country? But two, it gives us more draw for those other organizations to partner with UCLA, I mean, to partner with us. So um, it's been fantastic thus far. So I'm, 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 I'm excited to see where we go. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for that context. Mm -hmm. um, one of your early decisions based on that initial needs assessment was to focus on teacher recruitment and retention. And you touched on that just a little bit in your opening remarks. Can you, <clears throat> excuse me, can you share more um, with us why you identified this as your first priority um, and then the steps you took to begin to address the issue, including who was involved and how? And then lastly, um, share a little bit about the impact of that work, the work you did to focus on teacher recruitment and retention. So um, regardless of how amazing a principal is, <laughs> um, I believe that the, the number one thing that you can have to have an amazing school is amazing teachers. And the state of having high turnover, the state of having long-term subs and day-to-day -day subs in key subjects meant that no matter how, how good our plan is, it's not gonna be successful. So that was the first thing that we had to attack. So what we did was one, we got an, an, an autonomy from the UCLA contractor where we, we blocked the must place instructors and UCLA helped us to have the first access to uh, their student teachers that were completing in their teacher education program. So a lot of times we would get access to the leftover teachers. Now we were first in line. Now we can pitch our vision and get the, 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 the 
innovative teachers that really believe that they can change the world. And that's who you want that are willing to buy into your vision. So that, that has been a huge help in terms of changing the culture. It also sends a message to your kids that they matter, you know, and that they're gonna see that same teacher every single day. So that was huge. Um, did you wanna add anything, uh, Ms. Kushan? Um, sure. So our leadership team really focused on teacher support. So we built a program around supporting new teachers so that teachers would be would have the same vision and would be committed to stay here. So we know teacher turnover is a huge issue, um, especially in the high need schools. Teachers say for one or two years, we didn't want that at man. So some of the impact, okay, of course, um, I would say uh, uh, every year since we've started this plan, we've started with a full teaching uh, 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 stable of teachers. We didn't have any vacancies and that hadn't happened until this partnership. Um, so it's more stability. Uh, students more connected to the school, more connected to their teachers, more bought in. Um, our referral rate went down, our suspensions went down, um, our test scores prior to when we started the pandemic started to go up. We hadn't gone up in math in about six years uh, until uh, we had the partnership, until the kids were getting consistent instruction. We built a plan which focused on certain pedagogical strategies, but I think that in addition to that, because that was at the beginning stage, just having the consistent quality teacher helped the students initially. So, and it also helped us to build as we are, you know, trying to become masters at the pedagogical strategies that we were choosing to improve the school. And then we also had, uh, we expanded the school. So we were just a middle school, but we went six through 12. And just recently last year, we had a hundred percent graduation rate. And I think that's a testament to um, the amazing teachers. You know, I mean, like I said, I think that the teachers did an amazing job and they bought in. And because we had a small connected school, every child was special, not just the magnet kids, not just the gate kids, not the kids on this track or the kids, these special kids, every single kid was seen as that. And that's the only way we can have those types of numbers just in the beginning or thus far. Thank you both so much. Uh, so inspiring and also um, beautiful really, right? Of what's possible when you invest in staff, you invest in students, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna now turn to our guests from Ebasi, who are part of the Garfield Elementary School community in Oakland. David and Evangelina, thank you for joining us. Um, during the 13 years that Ebasi has partnered with Garfield Elementary, you've engaged in two formal needs assessments. Most recently in 2012, you hired a community organizer to lead a structured listening campaign or a cycle of inquiry um, to understand the key concerns of students, families, and staff. I'd like for you to tell us a bit about the process and its impact on school culture and practices at Garfield. And if you could please include some detail about what prompted this effort, why you took this particular approach, who was involved, and the key elements of the listening campaign. And you have three minutes for all of that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh... We, uh, at that time, uh, we, uh, Garfield had gone through a number of principles um, and that uh, it's, uh, it's a school that, that did not have uh, a strong sense of cohesion uh, and a kind of strong social capital. Uh, this is both among the professionals in the building uh, but also between the professionals and the parents and the families. Uh, and we got a new principal, a uh, first time principal, and actually he was sort of, he was, he was a 20 something. Uh, and so even his experience as a teacher, uh, while good, but was not very long. Um, and I think he quickly encountered a lot of uh, resistance uh, to uh, positive change. Uh, among his, uh, his staff. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, we had been talking to him and it's only really about a, more than a year long process of discussing and debating 
about, um, uh, about the need to uh, organize a base of leaders uh, among parents uh, to uh, uh, put a greater parent voice and greater uh, parent opinion about how to improve the school. Uh, and so uh, we got a, a, a very seasoned organizer uh, uh, who had long worked in the schools, particularly around the small schools movement in Oakland Unified. Uh, and uh, we uh, had them uh, meet each other and uh, she discussed a lot about her experience around organizing parents and organizing teachers. Uh, he was somewhat familiar with the small schools movement. And over a period of, of a couple of months, uh, he agreed to uh, engage and be uh, a sponsor of a parent-led uh, listening campaign. Uh, and so we started out with uh, basically just doing one-to-one -one conversations uh, with uh, uh, lots of parents I think in the end, they reached about uh, uh, close to 200 parents in a months long uh, process of doing these one-to-one -one conversations. And from there, uh, we learned that a lot of parents, first of all, we shared uh, school reading data and it was quite a shock uh, to a lot of parents about how low uh, the uh, reading scores were across the board. Uh, and also ar around some of the racial disparities in there. And I think people just did not have a sense, uh, a kind of a foundation about uh, essentially what good looks like uh, uh, there. And so uh, parents felt uh, very strongly about wanting to work with their uh, child's teacher and build a working relationship uh, so they know how they could uh, uh, best help uh, their child uh, in the school uh, and vice versa. And uh, they went, uh, groups of parents then uh, went on different um, uh, research visits, uh, uh, basically looking at different models of, of uh, uh, structures and programs and strategies uh, that help to foster a working relationship, communications between uh, parents and teachers. Uh, there were some schools that we saw in Oakland Unified. We also uh, were had, uh, we actually pre-pandemic, but we, we had a kind of a, a Zoom kind of uh, meeting with uh, the, the individual, I, feel, I, I believe was based in Arizona schools who kind of uh, uh, created the uh, academic parent-teacher team uh, strategy. And through those various research uh, activities, uh, parents, uh, 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 we all kind of collectively came up with this concept of what we call focus. They were uh, set every year that we would do five sets of face-to-face -face, uh, opportunities for teachers and parents uh, to, through a one-to-one -one process and through a classroom-wide process uh, to build relationships, exchange numbers, talk about uh, their own uh, personal backgrounds and talk about um, uh, how together they can work together to help uh, the child. Uh, and so we have been implementing that uh, for for a few years now, uh, and uh, it's um, you know I think the in in that case the principal felt that it was in his self interest to be able to have a body of parents that were really pushing the school to uh, make real concrete improvements in instruction and in academic achievement, uh, and so. He allied himself with the parents and the parents saw that and actually were very welcoming about seeing, because they, I think that they were kind of shocked that they saw groups of parents, parents wanting uh, to do this work. And we're a school that it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a large immigrant uh, community. It's also 
uh, very ethnically and linguistically uh, diverse. And so the language, it can be both a, it's an asset, but it's also a barrier to building that kind of social capital. And David, that, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to pause you there. There's so much I know that you have to share. Um, we wanna to get to the next question yep. and to the panelists as well. So apologies for cutting in there. Um, we have just a minute here for the second question, though I think this probably might come up again in the larger um, questions with the audience. But um, what were the, um, it's, a, it's a, a powerful and a different kind of process to engage a, a listening campaign with a community, by a community partner. Can you share a little bit about that, what worked well in that process and what you might do differently for folks who might be exploring a concept like this? And you have about a minute for this one. I think Yvonne Helena is going to take that uh, question. Sí, uh, pues lo que haría, lo que se seguiría haciendo, lo que se trabajó bien es involucrar en las partes, uh, como ya los mencionó el señor David, uh, los padres. Se formaron tres grupos, tres comités, uno de, de a los aprendices de inglés como segundo idioma, otro de los uh, padres con niños con eh, necesidades especiales y el otro eh, fue el core team. Entonces, el, el involucrar a las personas eh, este, que tenían injerencia o esa responsabilidad, en este caso los padres eh, que trabajaban conjuntamente con los maestros, fue algo muy exitoso porque tuvieron ese sentido de pertenencia de trabajar eh, para el bien común, en este caso, el, los niños, ¿verdad? De que los niños tuvieran éxito en la lectura que ya mencionó el señor David y en la cultura lat latina era que los niños fueran reclasificados antes de dejar la escuela elemental. Pero la cosa que no trabajó, que haríamos diferente, es yo, uh, desde mi punto de vista, es uh, que los nuevos maestros que se incorporan año con año a una escuela como Garfio tuvieran esa uh, anualmente un liderazgo, porque esos eh, maestros llegan nuevos y aceptan en la, en los focus five, o sea, las cinco reuniones cara a cara, eh, tres eh, al año, uh, al principio, mediano y final de año, cara a cara con el maestro, y dos en manera grupal. Lo que yo haría diferente es que esos maestros nuevos uh, tuvieran esa capacitación para que le siguieran haciendo la labor más efectivamente. Thank you for that, Evangelina. Really appreciate that. And again, we hopefully we'll get back to, to more of this in the next section of the question and answers. Um, we're going to now turn to um, Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School. So welcome again, Michael and Leslie. Uh, since becoming a community school, MLK has really embraced this concept of continuous improvement, something Abe shared with us as being so important. Can you share some examples of the types of assessments you've conducted and how you've brought all the stakeholders into that process? Um, and really talk to us a little bit about how continuous improvement is really integral to supporting and engaging students and families and educators. Okay, and let me give a little uh, backdrop um, before I turn Leslie loose. Um, first of all, MLK uh, is situated in the most expensive city in the world, but where we're located, we do not fit that demographic. Um, we have high poverty, high crime. We are located in, a, in, a, in this part of the city where the military base used to be, and the soil is contaminated, so the community is exposed to a variety of things. We are a school site that has approximately 500 students. One fourth of those students are English language learners. Our SBAC scores are consistently lower than uh, most middle schools in the entire school district. We also share, uh, we write the most referrals. Uh, we Prior to becoming a community school, we wrote, the, we wrote the most referrals in the entire school district, and we had the highest rate of suspension. With that, if you can figure Leslie becoming the community school coordinator, uh, she had come in and we transformed the school into being a community school. Leslie, what do we do? Hi everybody, my name is Leslie. Um, so we did a couple of different things. I wanna be super succinct about the concrete things that we did. I also wanna re be really clear about when we talk about assessments, I, I really liked what you know Abe was talking about. It's really an, a, a systematic way to listen. 
Well, all we're doing is listening to our young people, listening to our families and listening to our educators. It's just fancy jargon for that, right? Um, and so that for me makes it really easy for me to understand what we're actually trying to do, right? And so we did two assessments that I actually want to highlight that feel really important. One of which is a math assessment. People are very confused when I talk about math and academics because we're still working off this former narrative of what community schools used to be, which is wraparound service, right? For me, that's never been my focus. I'm a school social worker. That was my, my, my previous life. And so you would think, oh, I came in and my first priority was mental health. I have always prioritized instruction. And that's something for us to be thoughtful of at our school, what we've, we've been able to achieve. And we've been able to achieve leaps and bounds, 90% reduction in suspensions, 90% reduction in office disciplinary referrals. We've outpaced the rest of our school district by 7% in math and ELA scores. And we did that very intentionally. And one of the ways was this continuous improvement. So through our math program, what we did was, I don't know how to teach math, that's not my thing. But I, I spent hours reviewing math, the middle school math curriculum. I attended math department meetings. I listened to teachers. I sat in classrooms. I looked at the curriculum. We analyzed a lot of student academic data. And from all of that work that we all did together with teachers, we started a pilot program where we had data. We had acceleration classes where our math teachers did. Um, it's basically an intervention class for, for kids we assess where what their where the, their skills were at, and then based on that, we came up with a pilot program where two teachers were doing these acceleration classes. They co-taught by after-school program staff. It was also um, uh, launched um, intentionally to fill in gaps in knowledge. So we also purchased an online math foundational math program because our middle school curriculum does not allow for filling in those gaps in knowledge at this time. And so what we did was then we aligned our community partners. We, it, we provided a training to our community partners. Think about all the case managers, the tutors, all these people on this math program. And we all did it together to pilot this math program while continuously looking at the math data that how students were performing so that we can readjust every single month, the entire year. Um, and so that was one intentional way that we used assessment data, we, we, we listened to what kids were needing, and then we adjusted our programming based on that. And we aligned our families, our young people, and our community partners so that we were all on the same page to prioritize math for our young people. Um, so that was the first assessment that I really want us to kind of think about that it doesn't always have to be stress. It doesn't have to be social emotional. It's academic too. That's what school, that's what schools are for, right? Um, and then the second one is actually a comprehensive health survey. It took us eight months to do this. Um, we, we formed together a team. Um, it was all the things that Abe actually outlined. It was exactly that, almost exactly. Um, based on that comprehensive data that we spent hours, we are not researchers. Like it was like me going back to grad school, trying to figure out how to conduct a research study. Like I'm not an expert on that. I called people, we called people in, we formed a team. We had focus groups with young people, families and teachers on how to conduct the survey itself. And then what we did was we analyzed that data and then we were able to look at that data collectively. And then we redid how we did school and programming strategies. So we hired a health and wellness coordinator from that data. We'd reprioritize the things that we were doing because we knew that our kids were saying that they were really super duper stressed. It was really, really, really um, a lot. Um, so it, there's room for all these different um, assessments. Sorry, I'm stopping. No, no, no. I, I love the enthusiasm. I, I hate to uh, be the one to curb it, um, but I want to get to the next question. Yes, for, sort of a push pull kind of thing here, right? Um, so early on in MLK's transition to a community school, you engaged in a, in a school-wide adoption of project-based learning, getting back to the point of it's about teaching and learning. Can you share with us about the school's thoughtful process of reimagining teaching and learning with a project-based focus? And again, you have three minutes and to answer Okay, that. so that's a great question. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go back to that Venn diagram that Abe had sh shared previously, where you, if you can think in terms of wraparound services and then academics, 
and they're intersecting. And in the middle of that intersection, because we're saying this is a community school, so it's dealing with wraparound services and academics. In that intersection, we have students and teachers. And what we say in our community school is there's nothing more important than the relationship between the student and teacher. That's where the magic happens. And so then the community school model, we, we did a little reframe. At the core of it, academics is at the center. And we looked for a model that was going to be the best to address the heterogeneous classrooms that we had. We had children who were in the classrooms. Uh, you're going to be in a sixth grade math, uh, science class, and you might have seven different reading levels. How is a teacher supposed to address seven different reading levels in a sixth grade math class? All right. Well, then it's not just about the wraparound services, which really do support the needs of the students from the family, but it's also about, well, how do we support the teachers who are in the building? So with our community school coordinator, not only does she have to look for agencies that could provide the wraparound services, we also partnered with agencies that supported us around project-based learning. You ever went to Center for the Arts where they help uh, teachers come in and plan lessons that were connected to building structures inside, uh, inside the San Francisco community. We also partnered with the Disney Foundation out of the Presidio where they came in and they taught teachers how to create animation. But the thing that we settled on around project-based learning is we felt that it provided the biggest nuanced approach to instruction that will allow our teachers to meet the needs, the individualized needs of the students inside of our classroom. And then you begin from there, well, what needs to take place? And this is where I'm gonna say this structure around community schools, this can't be a principal driven thing. It has to funnel through the community school coordinator and the principal's job is to use the bully pulpit to support the community school coordinator to remove all barriers because this work and equity is too diversified and it's too complex to just sit with one person. And although I'm saying the community school coordinator is, is, is the person that's doing these things, she has a team of individuals that are working with her. She sits over structures and systems to make the school run. And so we sit back and we have to look at, well, what are the best wraparound services? Well, that comes from the needs assessment, right? Um, what are gonna be the best academic supports and needs for our students and our teachers? Well, that comes from actually talking to the students and the teachers, conducting surveys, doing empathy interviews. And so we did a lot of things to move us in that direction. Um, we also took some people where we're talking about a company school. Well, we took teachers to like El Paso, Texas. Let's go take a look at some schools that are doing project-based learning who are doing it well. Let's go down to San Jose. People who are doing project-based learning, they're doing it well. And then let's come back to our school and let's hold a conversation around where are we instructionally and then where do we need to go? Because then the gap between where we are and where we need to go, that's going to form our continuous improvement cycle. That's going to feed our PDSA. I don't know if there's anything you have to add to that, Leslie, who is amazing. Now, I'm a math guy, and Leslie's not. And so she showed up like, yes, Leslie had to go lean into some of this mathematics. And she's amazing. A social worker leaning into mathematics is a beautiful thing to see. I love this. And, I, you know, we've heard from two different school communities about the importance of um, going to places and looking together at, at practices. And I just love the research piece that you're integrating in. Um, we're gonna now turn to Abe. Abe, thanks again for being with us tonight. It's late for you in New York. So uh, much appreciation for sticking with it. Um, you mentioned in your presentation, and we've heard from some of our panelists, that you know, the culture of continuous improvement is, is important um, as we enter into community schools. And what, as, as folks that are on the call tonight begin the process of transitioning to a community school, what are the steps they can take now that will set them on that course of continuous improvement for you know, years to come? Sure. Uh, I have a couple of thoughts about this. And I have to say, I'm really loving the, the conversation. It's also great to see the partnerships even playing out on a panel. So um, kudos to the, the principal um, community school coordinator partnerships here. Um, so I think, I think what's really important here is to think about how to build a culture of improvement, right? It's not just we're going to do things. It's really how, how does it sort of permeate in everything that we do, um, which includes you know, building a practice of setting goals and defining results and not being afraid to fail, like seeing failure as an opportunity to learn. That is so hard sometimes for us to do. Um, and so I think one maybe concrete thing to think about is, um, is the way in which our relationship to data needs to maybe look a little bit different. 
Um, I think that we have been conditioned for so many reasons to think about data like it's a hammer, right? It sort of comes down on us and data has been used to pick winners and losers, right? You either pass or you fail the class. You either meet the milestone or you don't. Um, you get the grant or you don't. And I think it's sort of easy to understand why people are sometimes afraid to look at information, to look at data, because it always sort of comes with it, these high stakes sort of um, conclusions about whether or not you're going to you know, pass or fail. And so we, what we often talk about is, let's not look at data as a hammer. Let's look at it as a flashlight, right? What, what, how might the data sort of illuminate some things for us? Um, how might it inform what the needs are in our community? where the opportunities are, how we can plan differently. Um, and so, you know, and of course, as you heard some really good examples, how we can sort of measure improvement along the way. So it just sort of, it's a different way of thinking about how data becomes sort of an everyday occurrence and not just this thing we do at the end of something. And then we all sort of worry if we did it or not. So I think that's sort of one thing to really, um, to think about, you know, and, and, and there may be things you're doing right now that are aligned with that and some things that are more like hammers so we often tell people, look at all the data you're collecting, in which, in which cases are they being sort of used as a hammer? Is there a way to use them more as a flashlight? Um, the second thing quickly I'll just say is that it, getting more and more people involved in this work, I think ends up being a really good preparation for what's coming. Um, and, and that means that a lot of times we, we assume like we're engaging people in this work, but I'm engagement means engagement, like at every step in the process, including analyzing what the data are telling us. Who, who decides the interpretation of the data? Um, sometimes we bring people in way too late in the process. And so I would encourage folks to bring as many stakeholders as early as possible. Um, you, you're gonna get much, much better results. Thank you so much for that. Data as a flashlight, not a hammer. I think we should all remember that point, as among others. Um, so, you know, one of the things, this $3 billion investment in California and community schools, groups that are part of the partnership and many, many other groups see this as a tremendous opportunity for transformation. I'm wondering if you can help folks understand and think about how to balance this big, you know, meaty goal of school transformation with the need to start somewhere, right? You can't do everything at once. Um, and how do you do that while creating a sense of, of shared ownership across all these groups, as, you, as you've mentioned is so important? Yes, we're all very jealous of your $3 billion. Um, so nice job on that. <laughs> Go California. Um, no, it's super exciting. And I also know, I'm sure it's very daunting to think about like, hey, what are we gonna do here, right? There's you know, one of the, one, what happens oftentimes when you do these processes is that you realize we can do a lot of things, right? So how are we gonna know, you know, which one of these million things to do? And so, you know, I, I don't wanna minimize, I don't wanna trivialize this too much, but trust the process is sort of what we've learned. Trust the process, right? We have actually, we've developed an eight step process around needs assessment, which if folks are interested, we're happy to share that with them. Um, and, and it includes things like in guidance on how to build a team, about looking ex at existing data that you have, you know, at looking at there's a step around there around surveys and focus groups and individual interviews, and actually writing up a report that doesn't take forever, that gets to like, what did you learn? What did you do? What did you learn? What's next? And you'll find that during each, each of those steps of the process, in the beginning, it feels completely, we're never going to finish this thing. It's so daunting. But by the time you get to the third or fourth step, it's starting to come together for you. And so it's, I think you'll find that through, if you stick to the process, if you engage lots of different folks in this, I promise you it's gonna become much clearer. Um, you know, the other thing that I would just recommend here is to think about two, two buckets of action that you wanna sort of end your process with. There's one bucket that I would call is your core strategy, right? And so these are things that are, really challenging long-term projects that are real priorities, things like figuring out, you know, how to increase the kindergarten readiness of your incoming students. That's a big, big job, long-term. We heard Leslie talk about the work around math, right? That is long-term work, core strategy. Um, maybe it's, it's developing a sustainability plan to make sure that your investment goes on for even longer, right? So that's really hardcore work. That's your core strategy. The other 
you know, and again, these are things that are informed by your needs assessment um, and will take considerable time and effort. The other bucket though, or is what I would call a quick win or quick wins, right? And these are things that require less time, um, less effort, maybe less or no money, um, but are meaningful and are aligned with your priorities that are still kind of aligned with what you learn that people really need, that, you are, that you've decided are really important to do. And this could be like ensuring, for example, that there is interpretation at your meetings to get more folks engaged. Um, it could be, you know, in this, in this season, distributing at-home COVID tests, right? Like right now that's a hard thing for folks to get, but maybe at scale you can do it in your system. These are quick wins. Um, and so it's important to do both kinds of things. If you only do like the really long-term hardcore stuff, what ends up happening is you're gonna lose people along the way. And the narrative will be that nothing's happening at the community school because they can't see it. It's just too long a term, right? And they're not sort of seeing the value of it. Um, if you only do quick wins, then people are gonna be like, oh, there's some good stuff happening there, but we're not really changing anything, right? We're just kind of working in the margins. And where's like the real hardcore systems work that I get goosebumps about? Where's that stuff? You wanna do both things because they will, so they will support one another. You'll keep people engaged because they're seeing change happening through these quick wins, but they also know there is some real hard work going on and it's so important that we get behind that work as well. Thank you so much for that, Abe, and thanks to everyone for the, the, the contribution to this panel. We hope that this is just a starting point as you start to process all the information. We know it was a lot and we will continue having these conversations. So as we close, we just wanna thank everyone again, our presenters, our panelists, moderator, our interpreters, for sharing their expertise and their time and for all of you for participating with us tonight.